Welcome to the Movement Podcast. This show is all about movement. We tackle it from different angles, bring on guests, answer questions, go on a few tangents, and give practical advice, giving you guys a better idea of how you can optimize the human body to be the best it can be. Let me give you a preview of what's coming up in this episode. On today's episode of the Movement Podcast, Gray and Lee discuss creating new routines and how to seize the moment to create new habits. They talk about their own journeys with intermittent fasting and what catalysts spark them to create those new routines. We look at embracing self-change, movement in our grandfather's generation versus today, and people watching at Walmart. For the pros, we cover professional development, a different perspective on consuming education, and creating a system and a culture. We dive into tactic versus strategy, hamstrings, deadlifts, balance, breathing, book recommendations, and the bretzel. All of this and more on today's Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. So great, a lot's changed, uh, and the, the world's a different place now than what it was. And I think that's part is of of life. And uh, as humans, we've got to adapt to that. And I think how we adapt and respond is really what creates a better, healthy lifestyle. Is being able to take all the crap that's thrown our way and being able to deal with that and figure out a way through it creates resiliency, durability, and ultimately, in my opinion, it creates a lot, lot longer term healthy lifestyle. No, I, I think you're right. I, I, I had a lot of time to think about this because about uh, two and a half weeks ago, I was sitting on a plane coming home Sunday from one of the last flights that I think anybody should be taking at the time and sitting here thinking, wow, we're going to be locked down for a while. And the very first thing I started thinking is, you know how everybody always says someday or one day I'd like to? Well, you've had about 14 of them and you're going to have 30 or 40 more before anything changes and so the books you wanted to read the new things you wanted to do you need to do them I mean nobody's stopping you from walking around the block or grabbing a jump rope in the backyard or learning how to do Indian clubs or actually perfecting the Turkish getup that you've been bringing a lot of dishonor to so it doesn't really matter what you do but but I see a whole lot of people spend a bulk of their day talking about what's going to happen. What's getting ready to happen is more of the same. And so take some of this extra time that you have and, and sand down some of the things that you've been wanting to do. I mean, and, and that's when I, 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 I was the kid that, that absolutely loved the snow day because I always had all these things I want to do other than what my teachers wanted me to do. So when we got a bank of four snow days together, yeah, I played, but I did a bunch of other stuff. I explored a lot of other stuff. I'd finally do something on my motorcycle I needed to do. And it was, it was awesome. And so I had this whole to-do list that was never going to get done. It's half done already. So, you know, and I, and I haven't worked out that much, but I've been active like eight hours a day. So, <laughs> well, what, what happens sometimes is, is everything becomes a routine, you know? I mean, so now things have changed and we're in a different, we're kind of in a different place. Well, then you get right back into a different routine. Before a lot of things happened, you go to work, you know, you work your eight hour day, you come home, you may or may not exercise your kids, you're all this and that. And by the time you repeat the whole thing over again, well, now, Maybe you kind of got sucked back into that thing. And I think part of the thing we all have to do is realize that I've got to create change sometimes. I've got to change up. So what I did today, I need to do differently tomorrow. And always think about some things that I need to be doing that I may not want to do. Again, it kind of goes back to, you know, think about things you're really not good at and then maybe try to tackle some of those. The, the weakness. I, I imagine let's, let's fast forward our brains into maybe six, eight, nine weeks. We're all back at work. And you're looking at everybody else. Some people are thinner. <laughs> some people are, are, are a little plumper. And some people are exactly the same. And, and, and they're going to take those distribution. Or some people are going to be more positive. Some people are going to be more negative. Some people made the best of it. And so, you know, it's a trend. And you get to pick who you are now six weeks from now. Well, and, and you've got to still think about those things that – um, we all know that we can impact, you know, um, again, 
you know, right now, if, if we're sitting at home, it's easy to sit in front of the TV and say, okay, I'm just going to watch Netflix and I'm going to binge watch Netflix. That's okay every now and then, but you can't do that every day. Well, you know, it, and it was really weird. You and I started intermittent fasting near the same time. I think you had a bad experience in an international flight and you just said, I've been so sick lately. This is a great time not to eat. I did it because of a bunch of health concerns in the, in the, the funny thing was, you and I had the information that was very positive toward, hey, if, you, if, you're, if your life is stressed, if, you're, if your workouts are compressed, just changing the way you eat or maybe uh, compressing your eating window and increasing your non-eating window allows your body a lot more time to repair. You and I both started that at the same time for different reasons, and it stuck with both of us because as I was into my journey, I looked over, Lee. You look like you're dropping weight. And and we both started doing it. Now it's a habit I don't even think about because it actually feels feel, feels better. And so, you know, but a crisis actually caused your intermittent fasting, if you remember, and one caused it for me. And yet I wouldn't take anything for the experience that it gave me. So. Yeah, because I started looking a lot better than you. And <laughs> you said, holy shit, Lee, I got to do something. <laughs> So that was really what prompted. That was the crisis you had. It was. It was is the it, fact that you can't let me lose a few pounds and without you doing something. Well, I think it's easily been resolved because no, well, <laughs> I don't know about all that. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's you know, we got to hopefully if if we're we're responding to whatever's coming at us and we're creating the new habits, hopefully those new habits are going to be better. And I think that's part of what we've got to do. And I think going even going back to where where we focus our efforts in energy most of the time professionally is, you know, exercise and making sure you're doing certain things, setting a baseline. There's no reason you can't do that right now. If you're if you're going out for a walk, which is something the most common form of exercise in the world is walking. Well, if you get winded after walking for a mile, there's your baseline in a week. Try to walk a mile and a half. It's these simple little things that can have a huge impact. And before you know it, a month later, you're walking two miles. That's right. Three miles. The problem is, what comes next, though, Gray? People start trying to then, okay, I can walk a couple of miles. Let me start running. Well, we also have to tamp down that progression, if you will. It goes right from that first 5K that you ran walk to a Spartan race in eight weeks. And, and yeah, you're welcome to try most people who have our background would tell you that's not a good idea. Yeah. What's the what's the quote? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not, I don't know who gave me this quote, and don't you take credit for it because it wasn't you. More is not always better. Better is better. That's Brett Jones, or, or at least like I heard Brett say it. The yeah, first I don't time. know who the original. I'm not, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Brett Jones, maybe, but you know that's the thing, and that's the you know it's easy for our mantra has been move well, move often, and I'll give you credit for that one. Years ago, you can long before the book came out, you were saying move well, move often, and I think everybody gravitates to that because it's an easy thing to wrap your head around quality over quantity, but. How many people actually do it? Well, see, our generation had just do it from Nike. And there was a time and place where I think we were all a little bit more functional. Both our grandfathers were in World War II. And five or six pull-ups when they went through boot camp wasn't a big problem for them. Five or six pull-ups for most 17, 18-year-olds right now, big problem. And there's way more opportunity on the modern kids than there was on both our grandfathers who probably didn't get three square meals a day most days. Yeah, what was the average weight for the soldier in 1944 was probably 145, 150 pounds. Yeah. That, that's the first thing that makes pull-ups easier. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> be, be a smaller version but of yourself. That's, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, those people, what's, what's one of the biggest risk factors for injury? What's one of the biggest problems we have is BMI. Well, 145, 150 pounds at a 17, 18, 19-year-old, 20-year-old, you say, we see a 145 pound 20 year old right now it's an anomaly they're an outlier yeah yeah and they they were normal when we were all more that but but it's really easy to look around and if you're normal maybe that's not a good thing right now and and what other and, and matt was helping me with this doing some research what other physical diagnosis can be made by looking at you across the room if you're overweight or obese, there's a 99 point something percent chance you got a metabolic problem. I mean, we can try to be politically correct, but the whole thing is, if you're consuming more than you're putting out, you are a problem because the planet don't like that. 
nature don't like that and animals don't do that. We're we're the culture that decided let's consume way more than we produce from a physical standpoint. And again, most everybody thinks that they're more healthy than they are. But when you get right down to it, people people understand that, you know what, I'm not eating right. I'm not exercising enough. And I think right now this is an opportunity, you know, with everything, everything's changing. Our behaviors are going to be, our behaviors are forced to change. Well, let's look at an opportunity of how we can spin this in the, a different direction. But again, don't just think I'm going to go out and walk 10 miles today. You have to set some baselines and bring yourself up to that point where, okay, I feel a bit better today. The, uh, I think the latest Gallup poll, 2019, 81% of Americans uh, think they're in good or excellent health. But I think regardless of how many risk factors they're carrying, they look around and they have somebody their age who's worse off or maybe in the hospital or walking around with an oxygen bottle. And so compared to them, yeah, you're better, but that don't make you anywhere close to what you authentically should be. Who are you comparing yourself to? You <laughs> That's walk, right. You walk into Walmart. I feel pretty good about myself when I walk into Walmart. <laughs> So it's all about your environment. <laughs> yep, I, I think uh, we'll leave it at Walmart. Go walk around Walmart. <laughs> I like Walmart. You're either the outlier or you're not. <laughs> all right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll go a little bit deeper for the professionals out there. FMS is your baseline. The functional movement screen is an objective tool that measures seven fundamental movements that are key to daily life and determines if those movement patterns are optimal, acceptable, or dysfunctional. While the screen is simple and efficient to perform, each test has been strategically selected due to the significant feedback it provides on mobility, stability, and how both work together for larger integrated functional movements. Based on the screen results, FMS professionals can then prioritize exercise and programming to accommodate their clients' needs so they can achieve higher levels of fitness and performance. This highly customized exercise selection protects clients from factors that inhibit progress and produces self-aware clients and athletes who can now reach greater heights in lifelong movement health and vitality. Whether your focus is optimizing training, maximizing client retention, or enhancing communication, the screen helps you get there. It is the foundation for one of our basic beliefs, play to your strengths and work on your weaknesses. Explore our course options and get started today. All right, Lee, let's take a deeper dive. And, and, and I want to talk about professional development for a minute. And I think you're going to see where I'm going because it actually will be an asset when, when times change. Back in the early days when we're at the clinic together, it's me, you, and Kyle and the guys. And, you know, I'm barely on the lecture circuit. I'm doing about two, three talks every semester, but not doing a whole lot. If anything, as a group, we're taking more workshops than we're giving. We're, we're listening to Shirley Sarman. We're listening to Brian Mulligan. We're going to all these different things. We, we had all these people come through the clinic. And the cool thing is when we would consume continuing education, I don't know if it was just our culture or whatever, we wouldn't go and criticize anybody. We would look around and, and we'd be sitting in a course and we'd see stuff that we already knew we weren't going to use. It, it's not going to work here or we don't have that equipment. But we just let that wash over us. And we simply said, but we can use those four things. And I would basically say, guys, let's try to do justice to those four things for two weeks. And after that, there's no obligation. And if they stick, that means they're working. I trust this culture. And so what a lot of people don't realize is FMS didn't form because we locked ourselves in a room and said, we're going to basically come up with new rules for movement. It was basically us listening to the wisdom of everybody from Vladimir Yanda to Shirley Sarman to, you know, you, you get a couple of strength coaches in a room and we're talking about this. You're like, man, that's elegant. How did, and all we did was connect each of the dots at those transitions from injury to rehab to reconditioning to off season training to weight loss to adult wellness and started what are the common threads? And we saw some of those things. So the first thing I want people to think about is as you're consuming education, you will always see stuff that isn't right for you now. 
you don't need to do anything but acknowledge it, and you don't even need to tell anybody else because it might be right for them. What you need to focus on is those things you're like, I could implement that tomorrow, and I could see the feedback of that by next Thursday. And those are the kind of things we did, and I think because we didn't try to bash anybody else, we simply tried to say, I'm going to get one thing from over here and one thing from over here, it set us up to actually have a lot of conversations. And from that platform, I want you to speak to how many strength coaches in the in professional athletics have you been able to mentor on a cell phone because once they got their head around how we're looking at movement, you could say that guy's got a 1-3 lunge. Boom. You both on the same page, you know what you're talking about, you know the history, the extenuating circumstances, and you actually created communication, accountability, and a mental picture, and you're working remotely on something that used to take one-on-one -on -one live instruction, and that's no more timely than now. So if you know your material, and if you have a big box of tools, you can do a lot of good work remotely because our system says if you're not working on the weakest link, Please tell me what you're doing. Well, also kind of, Greg, what you're, to me, what you're alluding to is, again, the system and the culture you're creating. So whatever tool, and again, you know, we did a lot of education early on and still do education right now, obviously. But what you're talking about is you take in all education and you try to develop your own system and your own philosophy based off whatever tool or implement that is. And if you do that, you don't need the tool or implement. It's still the concepts and philosophy that you're following. And I think, again, my my experience and in, in point, to, you know, kind of going back to that whole thing with with uh, during education is I used to I was the orthotic guy. You know, I was building <laughs> I was doing everybody was getting orthotics. And I think where I where the light bulb on and that aspect went off for me was I I felt like I became better at realizing who didn't need orthotics. Exactly. Okay, that's the whole thing is I'm sitting here went to this class. Okay, now everybody's getting orthotics. I'm injecting these molds. I'm doing this. Not even thinking about it because everybody needed an orthotic. Well, when you start figuring things out, you realize all right that person doesn't. And I think going to what to kind of get back to what you you specifically asked me is I think if you've got good concepts, you can adapt. And you can figure that out, whether you've got the tool or whether you've got the equipment, whether you've got the environment, you can create that communication. And I think that's part of it when you're trying to you know, get into the remote training or, or the things that, that probably a lot of us have had, had to adapt to. If you've got that environment, the philosophy is still there. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. And you, you just said it's still going to be, let's make sure we're focused on the right thing and not clouding all this up with all these other things. Some of our most pivotal cases that you and I have consulted on started as a remote relationship. And we had to maintain the integrity of that relationship until the live uh, presentation uh, presented itself. And one of the issues that I adopted early as we went to all these courses as, as a team consuming that information is most people were showing us a tactic, not a strategy. They were showing us how to tape an ankle, how to manage a trigger point, how to basically activate the core. They were showing us a bunch of good tactics. What we came back and said, where does it fit in our strategy? Because it's really easy to let the orthotics own the day. It's really easy to let the dry needling and kettlebell well, well, own great. the day. Well, great. Speak to this. A great example and All something right. that everybody deals with. Okay is one of the first teams we consulted with, they called us because they're having all these hamstring problems. <laughs> so why, you know, we're getting all these guys who are having hamstring problems. And I remember going in and they'd bought all this fancy equipment that were supposed to address ham their hamstring problems. So long before you went in and actually started talking to them, I mean, we were uncovering a lot before we could actually think about what was going on the, with the hamstrings. The reconnaissance was done and we knew exactly what we were going into. And I think a lot of the times where I've gone into places that started having hamstring problems, it's somebody got hurt deadlifting, probably doing it wrong. And then all of a sudden deadlifts isn't part of the routine, but yet we're still squatting and leg pressing and hamstring curls and stuff like that. And there's something about the deadlift that tells the posterior chain how to behave. And if you delete deadlifts arbitrarily because somebody 
did it wrong or was taught wrong, that's not a good reason to delete it. So sometimes just bringing deadlifting or deadlift patterning or single leg deadlifting or some variation of a posterior chain stress lets you know where your hamstring problems are before they're a problem. And then and you get out of that. But there's so much reactionary exercise decision making that there is no strategy. So if you're going to go remote with somebody, most people will make you, almost ask you, almost demand, give me this tactic. I want to do side planks. I want to put magnets under my pillow. I want to do something. That's where they want to take the conversation. If you're a professional and you're worth the money somebody's paying you for remote, you must lay out the strategy first and then you will use the tactics right, that you trust. All right, give me an example. Because I know how you are, Greg. You're throwing a lot at us right now. So give me an example of what you mean by strategy. Okay. Uh, I've worked with a, a pro golfer remotely and said, listen, stop telling me all these things about balance. I want you to put a balance beam in your backyard. I want you to put your buds in and I want you to walk for three songs without falling off that balance beam. Took him a week to do it. He couldn't make it through three songs. By the time he did, the balance conversation was over. That's what I'm saying. You're trying to hack balance, and I'm trying to grow balance. When you're sanding a board, which right, stroke is the best? What's a tactic then? The tactic? Yeah. Oh, if, if he just said, I don't have a balance beam, we would have done something else. I just said, I want you walking So up. strategy was giving him the opportunity to create balance. Quit, quit thinking about balance and grow it. Babies don't think about balance. They grow your it. Your tactic was put your earbuds in. Yes. Balance is automatic. Hitting a golf ball is conscious. I need you to balance automatic while you're striping the hell out of that golf ball intentionally. And I think that's where a lot of people now trying to get into this remote training. And let's be honest, remote training is not right for everybody. And not everybody can educate someone on doing, doing remote training. Telling somebody, here's the strength, here's the strength program of today. Uh, here's what I want you to do. And you email it to them. You and I both know that's not going to work for everybody. Some people it might work for, but not everybody. So giving somebody more strategies and how to attack their issues really what needs to be concentrated on. Well, once I got the balance beam as a baseline and I got somebody who can't make it through half a song, I can say, hey, remember that toe touch progression that I put on the internet for you or whatever? Do that before the balance beam. Oh, you made it a song and a half. Do you have value for this corrective? Yeah. Do you know what corrective means? Yeah. It got me ready for the balance beam without practicing the balance beam. Good. Make that your cool down as well. So I always set the obstacle up and let them tell me they have difficulty. I don't tell them a damn thing about their self because they don't believe anything I say, but they believe everything they say. I think this is that's one thing that may come out of this whole new environment that we're in with remote training and people not being able to do certain things like they used to, whether they, they can't go to the gym or whether, you know, they can't afford the trainer anymore. There's still so many things. And I think that the one thing you just said is they got to create their own internal awareness because if they don't do that, they're never going to figure it out. Somebody wants to lose weight. Well, the first thing they need to do is step on a damn scale. Say, I weigh like this. Oh my God, because that's one thing that hit me. That was my big aha moment that I needed to lose some weight. Stepping on a scale for the first time in two years. So I think that awareness in your movements and even in your strength training, there's ways you can do that. How many squats can you do? Oh, I can't even squat. What does that even mean? Yeah. You know, so I think people just assume, hey, can you do this or that? Especially if you're remote training, you may they they may tell you they can squat, but you have no idea because they can't judge themselves. Well, the other thing is after we put the the few different videos we've done about the bretzel on the internet, it's 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 not a specific body part stretch. It's a movement pattern stretch. And and really, if you know the Thomas test and T-spine mobility, it's basically putting those two things against each other. The funny thing is I go into these pro organizations or military installations, see people doing the exercise that sort of we thunk up. And the funny thing is I walk up and somebody's just cranking out the bretzel. It literally looks like they're getting an appendectomy, right? And what does that look like? Well, it's the worst face you ever saw doing an easy stretch. But if it's not easy, the first thing you got to ask yourself is, listen, are you supposed to be holding your breath during a stretch? And if you are, you're probably going too far into the stretch or experiencing some discomfort. Both things 
We don't need you doing. I need you to breathe your way through this. There's nobody in yoga that would say, hold your breath during a liberating movement. And there's nobody in martial arts that would say, hold your breath during an explosive movement. Everybody's got a way you should be breathing. And so if I put you in a move and the very first thing you do is hold your breath, well, you can't survive in that place because if you can't breathe there, that's not somewhere your body's even going to remember how to get there. So my whole point is taking the exercise and not taking the intent and the awareness and the breath That's is the, basically taking the medication that is, wasn't designed which for Which I believe is getting ready to happen worse than ever. It is. Because people are going to assume they're going to start in this remote training and they're just going to take the workout and give it to their clients. And yeah, it may work for, again, it may work for some, it may not work for others. And there's things, information you can gather even from remote, you know, you start talking about education. There's still things you can do. Can you touch your toes? Can you balance on one foot certain ways? Can you walk for a mile? You know, one of the best, again, injury risk indicators is your mile and a half run. Yep. Well, what's your limit? What's your mile and a half walk look like? What's those baseline pieces of information that you can gather before arbitrarily assigning exercises. The Brutzel's a great exercise for some people. I'm not sure it's a great exercise for a gymnast. Right, right. I, I don't think it would add any value, but I honestly think when the general public consumes a workout, whether it be in a magazine or on the internet, I think they think if they just beat themselves down with those, those moves and those obstacles, they will simply wake up one day and have what I call Jason Bourne fitness. They won't remember how they got it. They'll just bake up, wake up one day and be badass. No, Jason Bourne had amnesia. He knew every step of the way of becoming who he was, and then he got whacked in the head and still retained the skills. But I honestly think there's somebody out there with a sledgehammer beating the shit out of a tractor tire right now thinking that... I'm going to be like Conan in two more months. You're not. You're just going to be an accountant with a sledgehammer and a piece of dented rubber. That's all you're going to be because there's no integrity or skill in that. That guy can't chop wood, right? Yeah. That's a whole different thing is lining up and using your legs and really splitting wood. And if you've ever split a truckload of wood, it is not even on the same planet as what you're doing to that tractor tire. Yet, metabolically speaking, there's a guy with a little cart rucking around that'll tell you that, that there is, and there's not. It's not. Yeah. So I think it still goes back to no matter, you know, when you start trying to do this remote training and do this, you know, off site counseling, if you've you got to build in feedback loops, you still have to do feedback. You still have to have your system in place yep. in order to ensure you're doing the right thing. And I think right now, a lot of stuff's going to get weeded out. In well, my opinion, over the next you know six months to a year, um, where any almost anybody could just prescribe something. Well, now it's not going to be as easy. You got to love people enough to confront them with their weakest link in as kind a of way as possible, because more than eighty percent of Americans thinks they're above average drivers. The math don't work. So that's called the Dunning Kruger effect. Anytime we learn something, anytime somebody drops ten pounds, before you know it, they're a spout. They're they're an exercise expert, and basically just. Shut up and let your actions speak louder than words and stay self-aware. You should be able to argue both sides of almost anything you're getting ready to invest your time in and then easily allow one argument to have a much better positive column than the other. It's a, it's a risk-reward thing, but most people don't even want to have the polarizing arguments because they just want to follow something and assume it's going to work like a Disney movie works out. It doesn't work out that way. You've got to be able to argue both sides of it. And if you do it intelligently, you'll know exactly what to do. Not in five minutes, but in about 48 hours. Most people ain't got that kind of time. Great stuff. All right. Let's wrap up this episode with a few questions. So intermittent fasting is a hot topic lately, and you mentioned it being part of both of your lifestyles. Was this more of a nutritional decision or more of a biohacking decision for you? Well, that's, that's good. Um, for me, uh, the, it started with just trying to remove some of the things in my diet that could cause inflammation because I was battling Lyme disease and actually recovering from a neck surgery. So I just said, I want to basically get all of the unnecessary inflammatory things out of my diet. The funny thing is I got seasonal allergies. As soon as I removed a lot of the foods, I'm not saying I was allergic to these foods, but foods that probably weren't jiving for my system, seasonal allergies didn't bother me anymore because all those things that cause inflammation sort of just fill up the cup. So I was just trying to reset my health and I had to talk with myself. I'm like, I am not nearly as active as I used to be and I'm eating the same amount 
So that's probably not a good idea. The shocker, you talk to yourself. All the time, man. Well, All I know. I mean, you're going to talk. It's just matter <laughs> when somebody's in the room well, or not. Gray will always listen, and that's why I like it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, for, for me, it was it was definitely more nutritional and just lifestyle. Um, you know, like like I said in one of the you know previously is I got on the scale. I knew I had I was way overweight or where I wanted to be, but I'd been probably like no different than most people. I'd been battling different ways to lose weight for years, um, and especially traveling and doing the stuff we do. I could never find the right way that helped me. And you know, I remember telling Gray. You know, I was doing the intermittent fasting, and I remember I, I went on one of my trips. I was in Korea or somewhere in Asia for 10 days, and it was like a light switched that I felt like, all right, this, I've got it, and my weight just went really down really quick. And I know that's what a lot of people have, have seen with intermittent fasting. And from this point on, the other, the other thing I think that has helped me is that when I started doing intermittent fasting, my water intake went way up. So my, my calories went down, my water tank, my water tank, water intake went way up. And I think that has probably been what's been able to help me out the most. Again, I'll, I'll keep saying it. I'm not sitting there recommending everybody do it. It just helped me. Well, I, the, the funny thing is I hear so many people that want to become a disciple of a single diet, whether it's paleo or totally vegan, plant-based or, or intermittent fasting. And the most profound thing I ever saw written or said by people who are on the other side of trying something new is it changed my relationship with eating. It changed my relationship with food. And, and really, you and I have been talking about that. When we put somebody through a movement screening process or a corrective strategy, it changes their relationship with exercise. Because when you show a runner, listen, let's cut your mileage back. Let's increase your, your mobility in your ankles. Let's re reestablish your core. Let's get one lift day in there a week and then go back up. They're, they're six months away from a personal record. And they didn't realize that they were trying to volume their way into, into performance. You can't do that. You've got to basically quality your way into performance. And so by cutting back a little less is more, but ultimately you changed your relationship with food. And I was actually scared to intermittent fast because anytime I would skip a meal in the old days and my blood sugar would crash, I would, I'd make somebody in the clinic cry. I was, you know, I'd get, I'd get hangry, but I didn't realize intermittent fasting isn't feeling like that all the time. It's feeling like that the first day, but you solve the second problem, which is if you feed that uh, drive to eat by simply drinking, they're the same signal. The signal to drink and the signal to eat are usually the same thing, and we get so used to eating instead of drinking that we're in a constant state of dehydration. So much so that most people, if we get them a little bit more balanced out, they can change some of their movement tests in a day or two just by more fluid intake and less bad calories, and all of a sudden the system reaction time is just a fraction better, but that's where mobility and stability start. Nowadays, we are constantly getting hit with information from so many angles. To optimize our consumption of educational content and not waste our time, could you give us an example or two of sources you would recommend us reading or listening to? I think uh, uh, Rob Wolf did a, a book a, a while back, and he just basically confronted the way you eat, the way you sleep, um, the way you move, and your relationships. And usually one of those is, is pretty toxic and can explain a, a lot of your problems. So, so many people try to optimize one thing without getting another aspect of their life completely out of the gutter. And it's a, it's a hard thing to do, but you know, if you go through objectively the things that impact your mood in your wellness on a daily basis, just start removing the stuff that stinks. And and if and if you don't think it stinks to you, tell a, tell some other people. But you know, wash it across that and and protect yourself from those bad habits and those those toxic things that you're doing. If you're watching TV at 2 a.m. trying to get fit, just realize that you're battling cortisol right now because your sleep's messed up and you're not going to out exercise it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard. I know that's you know, I think it's hard to say. This is who, this is a great resource or that's a great resource. Because I think it, again, I hate answering a question with the whole word depends. But I do think it's almost like you as an individual have to figure out what you need. What advice do you need today? 
And then go, then you go ask people around you in your own environment, who do you listen to? I, you know, if I'm looking for a new book, I'm going to ask Gray. I'm going to ask uh, John Tareen, people that I surround myself with, who I, you know, aspire to be like and ask them. And I think, you know, for someone listening to say, Lee, what are you, you know, what, what are you listening to right now? Well, shoot, what I'm listening to right now is not what I'll be listening to three days from now or a week from now. I'm going to find what I, what's going to help me right now and go ask some people that I trust um, to give me some of that good information back. But again, I think the, the key component here, if we're talking about lifestyle, health, wellness, and movement, find out what you, what you really need to be learning more, what you feel like you need to be learning more about, and then go just in your inner circle and ask people about what they're doing. My wife's a great example. She's, she knows she's looking for stuff, and she'll go ask some of her friends what they're listening to, what they like. Because again, if you don't like listening to somebody, doesn't matter. What I like is not going to be what Gray likes sometimes. Exactly. And uh, James, you can stop Le- right there. Exactly. Just telling me how great the answer was. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drop another book. That's I helping. know you are. James Clear, Atomic Habits. And, and I think the point of that book is once you know what you need to do, that's the next hard part. What he tells you in that book is don't try to adopt a new habit. Let's use the exact same reverse engineering to break the bad habit. So if you can't break the bad habit first, don't start adopting new ones. You know, a green tea after your diet Coke does not do the green tea. Find your all. weakness. Yep. Your weakness is your biggest opportunity. Yep. And it's hard to look at, but do it anyway. That'll do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and share it with your friends and family. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your movement journey, visit us at functionalmovement.com. Until next time, be sure to move well, move often.